to Welcome to episode 27 of Caucus Live, brought to you by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Houtman. Today we're going to talk about concealment, why it matters, how to get good at it, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of concealment, and how can you tell how much concealment is enough? Welcome to episode 27 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are broadcasting live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Let us know where you're watching from, and as always, if you have questions during the show, try to get them in before we go to break. So a uh, couple of weeks ago, we talked about mental skills to stretch your training dollar. And then we had a little time off for the holiday. Now we're back and we're going to talk about concealment. This is one of those topics that actually tends to be pretty controversial, kind of surprising, but it is. So we're going to demystify some of the common arguments for and against concealment and get a little deeper into the topic. Our guests today are John Houtman of Filster Holsters and Andrew Henry of Henry Holsters. They are two of the foremost experts on holster design and concealment principles. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. (laughs) <laughs> so to start out, we'll start out uh, and, and we'll do something I rarely do on this show, which is I would like you two to introduce yourselves or introduce each other and tell us why we should listen to a holster maker about concealment, because not all holster makers are experts in concealment. Funny enough, you know, you think uh, you think that would be important if you're making concealment gear, but it's actually not the case. So where did you guys come from? What's your background? And uh I'm going to mute my mic while you're talking so you don't hear the puppy howling. (laughs) All right. I'm Andrew. This is John Hotman. He runs Filster Holsters, formerly of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I first started doing work with John in 2013 and 2014. We met each other through the internet. We both owned small holster companies at that point, and we were collaborating on projects that needed more capital, more resources, and more creativity than either one of us had by ourselves you need to talk to a holster maker about concealment because we're like tailors for clothes. If you want to understand how fabric works and how the cut and drape of a garment works to make you look good, to make you accomplish your goals, a holster maker is the person who will understand the ins and outs and all the tools that are available. So I've often used John as a resource over the years to help me refine my understanding of how concealment works, what we're trying to accomplish, what our acceptable standards are and how we're going to get there. So, He knows what he's talking about. I've known Andrew for uh, a number of years. When I originally started off and had the Philly EDC YouTube channel, which consisted of me scrabbling around in the dark to figure out how to make holsters, Andrew was someone uh, who I was in touch with through the sort of like growing DIY holster uh, making community. And we got into touch then and we uh, shared a lot of information about the technical how-tos of how do I make this hot kydex fold around a gun into a gun-shaped thing that I can then subsequently attach to my body. And then from there, we kind of like went our separate ways for a little while and each had our own small businesses. And I encountered a bunch of, you know, technical um, manufacturing issues that I was unable to overcome. And Andrew was in the background, you know, uh, coaxing me to do better and showing me all the things that he was working on. And I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're doing. And this looks like witchcraft and I'm already too invested in whatever wrong process I'm doing. Um, And eventually I was so completely impressed with the uh, workmanship and the process 
and the productivity and the efficiency and the end results and the consistency of everything that he was doing, I felt so like I was so flummoxed and I was, and I turned around to him and said, how would you like to make all of my holsters for me? And that developed into a relationship where we do a lot of design work together and we have our products executed at Andrew's shop, which is why I'm here. In Bloomington, in Indiana. Instead of in Minnesota with my lovely wife. Uh, and uh, I've been impressed with Andrew for so many years. And this is, uh, we have developed a inseparable working relationship. And we go back and forth on technical ideas, on conceptual ideas. We talk about concealment and how it's accomplished. We develop new technologies and new designs in order to accomplish concealment in a uh, highly collaborative uh, business. and. Fate brought us together. Fate brought us together. <laughs> That's awesome, actually. <laughs> it's, a, it's a match it's made a, in heaven. It's a, so, it's a business and moral crusade that we're on together. And so up next, I want to talk a little bit specifically to you, John. And Andrew, you can chime in if you have something to, to add to this as well. Uh, but, but tell me about your background and your previous living situation and why concealment mattered to you, uh, like when you were living in Philly. So I came into, I'd all, I, I had always been interested in guns growing up as a kid. Um, I took myself to a firing range uh, for the first time when I was 21 and able to go on my own in Philadelphia. And it was this kind of like hole in the wall in a terrible neighborhood and Philadelphia being kind of like a big East Coast city, going to the gun store had about the same kind of like, if, if, you, if you went to the gun range, People, and told someone about it, they would look at you as though you told them you had gone to like a porn theater or something. It was like that same social kind of stigma. Like, yeah, so that was a pretty significant social stigma. So, uh, and some and some of the ranges were run down in a way that seemed likely to be fairly comparable, right? And and, <laughs> and I uh, I got involved in 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 firearms, and I had uh, I had been a victim of a of of a armed robbery when I was twenty years old before I could have a carry permit. And that kind of like inspired, that kind of got the bug in my head about taking guns a little more seriously. And as I got further into uh, my twenties, I started carrying a gun when I was an auto mechanic, working in some bad neighborhoods late at night. Uh, you know, there were some places, you know, I would travel from shop to shop occasionally and uh, have, you know, after hours, a, a significant amount of uh, equipment or money with me at the time. And I decided to take uh, carrying a gun seriously. And I had gone to art school prior to that. And at the time I started buying holsters and then carving on them. And there were cool holsters that you could buy, but they weren't super available. And when you're brand new to guns, the easy thing to do is to go through guns really quickly. I bought this one. I didn't really like it because I don't really have any frame of reference for liking anything. And then I get a different pistol and you go from gun to gun really rapidly. And at the time there were these really cool holsters that I wanted to buy, but they had like a 16 week turnaround time. And I'm like, I might not have the same gun in 16 weeks because I'm <laughs> clearly f foolish about my gun taste. And I went to art school and I've been a mechanic. If I can't figure out how to make a holster in 16 weeks, then I give up. And now I'm, you know, 10 years later and I'm still figuring it out. That's super cool. Okay. Um, so I want to talk. Uh, before we get too deep into this, if there's anyone listening that doesn't know what we mean when we say concealment, how would you define concealment? So, you want to rock? No, go for it. Okay, so <clears throat> people tend to not have a universal definition of concealment when it comes to carrying a gun. The way I define a the, the way I determine whether or not a gun is concealed is by evaluating whether or not someone who is attempting to detect your gun would have to violate some social or physical boundary in order to detect it. Either they would have to lay hands on you, which is a physical boundary violation, or they would have to stare at you for long enough that they risk themselves being detected. People are like really highly attuned to gaze at each other's gaze like you can look at a crowd of people and see who's trying to make eye contact with you like we're, we're really tuned into that and each of us has kind of like a uh 
culturally attuned timer for how long you can s- stare at another person in public before you look away for fear of being detected, right? And so after about this amount of time, we're highly- It's aware, noticeable. Right, it's, it's noticeable. And, and it, you can notice yourself doing this. You'll see someone in public and you'll glance at them a few times and you know that if you were to stare at them for a long enough time, you start to become as uncomfortable as they would feel if they noticed you staring them, staring at them. So if it, if your gun is sufficiently concealed, that would mean that someone would have to stare at you for an inappropriately long enough time past the point where they would want to risk detection. And now obviously there are other things that, you know, so if I have a lump under my shirt and I'm wearing my NRA t-shirt with my Punisher skull hat, it's faster for them to assume that it is a gun. For example, right? You notice the difference in the person's outline. You pick up on the fact that it's angular and not organic. You, uh, and then you pick up the other context clues that they might be providing. And that can either lengthen or shorten the amount of time that someone has to stare at you in order to detect a gun. Yeah, so it's basically like giving them a, th- a mental shortcut to figuring out what exactly that lump or pointy shape is. Right. So one of the things that people are really good at is noticing what's different, right? We can detect someone who's walking against the flow of a crowd. We can pick out someone with a limp. If you see someone who has something different about them, you will subconsciously notice that there's something different, direct your attention to it, and then evaluate what's different. Yeah, we've got an audience question here. If you want to address that one real quick. Uh, I interpret that as, can somebody know that I'm carrying by like the position of the, the bump under my clothes? Is that how you would interpret that question? I think it's a misspelling of sight, but if a person can determine from a distance only by visual inspection that I'm carrying, then I would consider that firearm not to be concealed. It might be openly carried. It might be under a garment. I think for me, my definition of concealment concerns some element of control over what I project out. And if I have a firearm concealed, it is not easily detectable except by what John described as like socially inappropriate attention. It's not detectable by any socially normal amount of attention unless I choose to expose the firearm or draw the firearm. So if a person is able to observe from a distance, either from my gate or the lump projecting through my clothing, that I have a firearm, then by my definition, that has failed the concealment test. And it is definitely very possible to distinguish a firearm at a distance. I often do see firearms on people in public, and I think that they think that they're concealed, and they're not. Yeah, and that's that's a question I want to get to um, in in one of our later se- um, segments. So, would you say that concealment is like a yes or no state, or more of a spectrum? Well, it can't be either. Oftentimes, it's very yes or no. It's, but that middle is yeah. a spectrum. It's. It's a it's a steep cliff, not a shallow <laughs> spectrum. It's it's like uh, in Photoshop when you use the gradient tool and you move it only a very small amount, so all the gradient happens here, and then the rest is all one color. <laughs> that's 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 kind of the the spectrum that we're on, where the spectrum is highly compressed into uh, one narrow band of the spectrum. So you can be concealed, and then it very rapidly goes from concealed to not concealed, and this can change depending on. Uh, your clothing and appearance, the what the holster's doing for you or not doing for you, the size of the gun, all, all these different things like can, you know, very small changes can go from concealed to not concealed. You could be perfectly well concealed and have made a, uh, <clears throat> you could have a wardrobe malfunction and immediately go from concealed to not concealed, right? So, um, and you know, when you're talking about concealment, are you talking about the letter of the law or are you talking about something else? Are you talking about more of a... As holster makers, we are strictly dealing in non-legal definitions. We are dealing in the practical aspects 
of a customer using our gear, carrying concealed in a way that works for them. Gun laws, as we know, vary widely state by state. Some laws have brand, some states have brandishing laws, some don't, some allow any method of carry as long as you have a license or permit. Some have restrictions on mode of carry. And so concealment in the context that we discuss it has nothing to do with what meets the legal bar of concealed in your state. Gotcha. Okay. And what I want to touch on before we go to break, and I know this is a complicated question, but uh, but let's kind of get into this a little bit before uh, before the break. What is the point of concealment and why should I care if somebody sees my gun? You know, most people aren't paying attention. You know, they're looking at their phones. Why does concealment matter? Well, because the people who aren't paying attention aren't the people aren't the reason why I carry a gun in the first place, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't carry a gun because of, you know, all the people who are looking at their phone and don't care. I don't, I, I carry a gun because of the people who are capable of causing problems for me. And the people who are capable of causing problems for me are people who are definitionally capable of detecting a gun. Yeah. Oblivious, non-aggressive people are not why I carry a firearm. And are there any disadvantages to concealment? I, I think that <laughs> some people might make the argument that, oh, well, concealment is slower than open carry. I don't believe that to be the case. If you're open carrying in any holster that is appropriate for open carry, by which I mean a Safari Land duty holster and nothing That's else. It. Um, if you're really good with a Safari Land uh, ALS holster, you're getting into the one second draw time. If you're really good from concealment, you're getting into a one second draw time. I don't think there's a substantial difference. Now, what's not mentioned here is time not on the timer how much time do you have before you draw and what options do you have there if my gun is concealed then i have all the options in the world i have the option to not get involved i have the option or the potential to not even be selected for anything if you have your gun on display you are much more potentially uh voluntold either by the people who are doing crime or, you know, any other context. So how much time do you buy yourself before the incident by being concealed? What does surprise get you, for instance? What does undetectability get you? As opposed to the obligation of that comes with being detectable. Yeah, and I guess uh, if you're talking about the disadvantages of concealment, I would add one to that and say that concealment can be difficult to learn. So you have to plan on like investing some time into learning how to do it well, and not everybody really wants to do that. Anything you're going to do daily, regularly, in a variety of contexts throughout the different seasons is going to be a challenge. Like there's, there's very little that's analogous to conceal carry. Um, there's almost no other accessory, accessory other than a phone that people will carry religiously in every context, everywhere they can. And the uh, touching back just briefly on your previous question, I've often heard the argument for open carry or an unconcealed carry as a deterrent. And that's difficult to quantify. I don't think the deterrent factor is a non-zero value. But for myself personally, and I only get to make concealment decisions for myself personally. I don't get to make decision concealment, concealment decisions for my customers, not for my family members, not for anybody else except me. For me, I value choices, options, and time far more than I value the perceived deterrent factor of an openly displayed firearm pre-incident. Yeah, and I, I, I think about the deterrent factor kind of like the uh, hand sanitizer problem, right? It kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, right? 
uh, except for the absolute worst superbugs. In which case, essential oils are in order. Right. <laughs> uh, your openly carried gun might deter 90% of criminals. They might even deter 99% of criminals, except for the person who is not afraid of your gun, knows that you have it, and is extremely practiced with terrifying levels of violence. Prisoners, for example, attack each other all the time. They're all, they all have nothing to do other than work out and be dangerous and, you know, make homemade knives and carry them around on each other. So you, you know, in that context, you have a dangerous person attacking another person who they know to be dangerous in spite of them being dangerous. That person is not going to be afraid of you with your with your openly carried gun and your serpa they're going to harm you and take it from you and we see stuff like that happening with some regularity yeah that's kind of an interesting point too so on one hand you have the potential for a deterrent effect and then on the other hand you have the potential to be selected because of the gun and so that's something you would have to kind of balance for yourself um i know for me, I can I can probably pretty safely assume that anyone who chooses to attack me has more experience with violence than I do. And uh, just for that reason alone, I'm not going to add any reasons for them to select me out of the crowd. All right, anything to add? There's like silence over there. I'll just fill the, the silence reason- with the puppy howling. <laughs> The reason I think consumer is contentious, as you mentioned earlier, is because it's very easy to become comfortable in the contexts and environments that we normally live in. And it's very difficult to accurately and emotionally imagine a completely different context that somebody else lives in. And when we discuss concealment, what works for me is probably not what needs to work for you. And I don't get to decide that, and I don't even get to fully understand it. But when we talk as holster makers about concealment, we do get to deal, like in in physics, you have theoretical physics and you have experimental physics. You have physicists who discuss theory and all its implications, and then you have the experimental practical aspect of when we do this, what happens? And the principal discussion of how concealment works, what its value is, how much we should be willing to expend resources in time, training, money, gear to pursue it is a completely different discussion from the incredibly practical concern of when I put this holster on this person, do they get what they're looking for? And if they don't, can we help them get there? And if we, if we can, how do we get there? As a holster maker, those are the practical tools with which I am incredibly concerned. Because for my customers, that's what they're coming to me for. Not a discussion about the principles of consumer, but helping them live the life they want in their context with their tools as effectively as possible. Yeah, I like that. That's that's one of those things like your customers come to you having already decided how much concealment they need for their life and they're just trying to achieve it. Uh, So when we come back from break, we're going to talk a little bit about how to decide how much concealment is right for you. Hi, it's Brian Strauser, chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and the shooting sports. Please consider joining us as a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month, or choose one of our other annual membership options. You can learn more about us at gunowners.mn and become a member at gunowners.mn slash join. A tick or two. That's good. One thing is enough. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to John Houtman and Andrew Henry about concealment. So we just kind of defined concealment. We talked a little bit about why a person might care about it. 
Uh, and in this next segment, I want to talk a little bit about how to determine how much concealment is enough, right? So your customers come to you having already decided how much concealment they want no, to achieve. No, often they don't. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah. Elaborate on that. You know what? Real quick, though, I'm going to jump in and be the bad cop to your okay. good cop immediately. Concealment, I believe, is contentious for a couple reasons. One is that people historically have not gotten really great results with concealment. It has been a somewhat mysterious, difficult struggle for a long time. And people don't often don't know what it really takes to conceal a gun. I think the accomplishing concealment has historically and traditionally so far been accomplished by uh, buying a whole bunch of holsters until you luck into getting something that's pretty okay. And that pretty okay for a lot of people is the upper limit of concealment. People don't think that you can actually make guns really vanish. So they settle for a level below vanishing. And then they assuage themselves with I don't believe that it's a fact that people don't notice you printing. I think that's something that people who print say to themselves and each other in order to become comfortable with the fact that causing your gun to vanish is mysterious and not widely discussed beyond, oh, I've got a drawer full of holsters and this one gets me to 80% of vanish. Yeah, historically it has been difficult and expensive to vanish a firearm. People are only recently coming to widely understand the mechanics, the you know, uh, experimental physics, the mechanics of concealment and what you have to do to the gun to cause it to conform to your body and exist in the gap between your body and your clothing such that it is always concealed. What I really like about the physics analogy is that experimental physics are replicatable. And if we're talking about accurate, actual concealment principles of how a gun interacts with the body, how leverage works, how negative space and the drape of your fabric and all the different things that we can adjust and tune and work with, if those things are actual, then the results should be able to be duplicated by anybody who applies those principles correctly. And if they can't, then we're talking about who knows what. But if they can be duplicated, then we've actually hit on something substantial. Yeah, I, I think you guys have for sure. So one thing I want to add too, like why is concealment such a contentious topic and why do people argue themselves to a standstill about it? Uh, I think part of that comes from an inability to place yourself in another person's context. So for some people, printing really doesn't matter. When we, say, when we say printing, we're talking about when you can see the outline of the gun through the clothing. Um, say yep. you live in a town of, um, you know, population 125, and you know everybody in this town on a first name basis, and you guys all hang out at the gun range together. Does printing matter for you in a day to day basis? In Probably no meaningful way, no. It really doesn't. Nobody cares. You know, like you don't even really have to throw a t-shirt on over your gun. You can let it hang out. Nobody cares. Now you take another person who lives in the city, um, possibly places where, uh, like in Minnesota, uh, we have, we have uh, signs where you can ban carry, but those signs don't have the force of law unless you're asked to leave uh, and you refuse. And, and that's the only point where you've committed a crime, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so say you live in a city where, you know, the grocery store you go to, um, you know, the, the sports events you go to, all of the things that you want to do are, are uh, you know, guns not welcome zones. <laughs> Printing matters a lot for you. So I think a lot of the reason people argue so much about this is because, you know, somebody over here is looking at somebody over here and they just can't put themselves into that situation uh, to realize that, yeah, you know what, that person is right for them, maybe not so much right for me. Uh, and then the other problem is, of course, people give advice from their context, not realizing that that advice is wrong for others. 
Yeah. And, and in both directions, there can often be an implicit feeling of moral judgment almost. Right? Yeah. The, the person who is much more attentive to concealment critiques the person who isn't as concerned about it. And it come, it can come across as, well, you're a slob and yeah, like you're, you're just careless. hanging out there in the breeze because you don't know, you don't care. You're an idiot. And the other direction, the person can say, you are like the gun equivalent of a clinical germaphobe. You are living in la la land and you are obsessed with how you think people see you and nobody cares. Now, I think some of the contention comes, some of the contention that we see specifically comes in the advice giving category. People yep. ask, how do I make my, my gun conceal? And then people from a different context will say, oh, well, you're printing way too much and harp on them about it. Or someone will say, well, you know, no one notices you printing. No one notices you printing isn't concealment advice. Bet on nobody noticing isn't the path towards success in any craft. No craftsman who's like making a piece of furniture and makes an error. How do I make this better? And the advice is nobody notices. Nobody notices. It's like, no, I, I, I want to be good enough at this that I don't have to cross my fingers that nobody notices. So I think some of the clash is from the clash is centered around advice giving. Someone asks for help or advice or technical skills to improve upon what they have towards some goal that they, they have. And someone comes along and either chastises them for not doing a good enough job without providing actionable paths towards improved concealment or someone comes along and says, ah, it doesn't matter anyway. And, and there really is as in consumer, almost as in any other thing, there is a kind of an 80 20 rule in effect that a certain number of very basic approaches and tools will get you way far ahead of a person who does none of those things and getting the last 20, 15, 10, 5% of concealment that makes the gun vanish in a way, even that surprises experienced people who look for guns for a living that requires an inordinate amount of effort often to really get that dialed. And in many contexts, it isn't the juice isn't worth the squeeze, but in the context where it is worth the squeeze or is required for the squeeze, nothing else will do. Yeah, that's spot on. I, I think I'm going to save this and pin it in a couple places because this is a great discussion. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about some of the practical stuff. So if you um, say you're new to carry, how can you tell if your gun is concealed? Do you have any tips for people who are trying this out at home? Well, I think uh, in, in today's day and age, it's really simple to just set up your phone, put the front facing camera and walk around and do a bunch of movement and, put, you know, do all the things that you would normally do. Yep. What, what do you do in your normal day? You bend over, you stand up, you squat, you reach over your head, you reach ahead of yourself, you twist. And, you know, you go through your normal human range of motion, video yourself doing it, and then look at the video. And if your if the presence of your pistol is discernible through your clothing in uh, enough of those contexts or you know, th through enough of those ranges of motion that you're not comfortable with how readily that would be detectable, then you proceed to make your adjustments from there. Yeah, the old stand in front of the mirror and look at myself while I sort of twist left, twist right, bend back a little bit, am I concealed? That's not really a great test. We all have a camera in our pocket and it is a tremendous resource. It can allow you to view yourself from the angles and distances that other people view you in real contexts. And that feedback is incredibly valuable. You will notice things that you do. And you can even like, I've sometimes done little scenarios like I hate standing in line. I'm an impatient person. And when I'm standing in line at a store, like I don't stand still very well. And if I fidget, I fidget in certain habitual ways. And like I can actually set my phone camera up and pretend I'm standing in line and like actually go there. 
and see like, what do I do? Where, where do I put my hands? How do I shift my weight? What do I do? And, and see, am I doing things that I'm not really paying attention to that if I noticed them, I would not want myself to do them? Maybe. Yeah. And also, you know, stand around and give yourself some time for your posture to do the things it does when you're not paying attention to it. Right. When you're standing in front of the video camera, your posture is very different than if you're just like fetched out and, you know, you know, looking at your phone or reading something, you know, your hips might change angle as you stand long enough to, you know, set in one place. Uh, you might lean in a certain way to balance yourself out, favor one leg or another. And when you might find that when you relax your posture and lean over in a certain way, that's when your gun starts to become visible. You can also do the significant other check, right? If uh, you live with a, a roommate or a spouse, you can play spot the gun with each other. Uh, you're getting ready to go out and you show them your outfit. And if they ask, oh, are you carrying a gun? Well, then you're probably concealed well enough because your spouse knows you better than anyone. They'll notice the differences faster than anyone. They know that you're typically carrying a gun. And if they have to ask, if your spouse has to ask if you're carrying a gun, it's probably concealed pretty well. Yeah, that's a that safe touches baseline. On, that touches on something I also wanted to get into, which is when you're new to carry. So we talked about what people notice and, and, you know, people's perceptions and how we don't really want to rely on luck or on other people's uh, <laughs> other people's inattention for our concealment plans. Right. But there's another legitimate thing that happens when you're new to carry is uh, you are, I'm going to say a word irrational, um, but I don't mean this in a judgmental way. I mean this strictly in the like technical definition of the term. But when you're new to carry, you have in an irrational uh, kind of focus on the gun. So it feels really obvious. And that's normal. Everybody goes through that phase when they start carrying. Um, so if you're in that phase, is there any way to um, to kind of get through that and balance your perception of how concealed you actually are? Well, uh, getting over being self-conscious or insecure about something requires that you confront that and prove your insecurities wrong. It's kind of like a, like a form of exposure therapy, right? Are you concerned about printing? Well, you do your absolute best to conceal the gun and then go do normal things and uh, accrue to yourself the validation, the experiential validation Equity. of, yeah, of doing all the normal things and not being detected. Put yourself in context where you might be more likely to be detected and get through those without detection, and then you develop confidence in your concealment. This is the only place where the nobody cares that you're printing advice has some, it, I think it's misguided, but it does have some application in essentially saying nobody can actually see your aura, but they can see when you fidget like a maniac. Mm -hmm. So just stop touching your gun, stop adjusting your clothing, and just ride it out and see how it goes. And I, I don't think that the nobody cares your printing is actually that helpful, except in it's, trying to trying to mo moderate the emotional feeling of they're going to know. It's a little like uh, imagine the audience being naked to get over the fear of public speaking. Yeah, it's like that imagine the audience in their underwear. It's like, well, that doesn't get you over the fear of public speaking. Public speaking a lot gets you over the fear of public speaking. Yeah, that's actually kind of a pet peeve of mine. And the reason it bothers me is because a lot of times when we talk, uh, when we say things to new carriers, like nobody notices you printing, what we intend to do is, you know, soothe their irrational fears. But what we end up putting out as a message is lower your standards. And that's the part that bothers me. So what I would rather do is is teach people to have higher standards and more skill. And in all of my life experiences so far, I have never achieved confidence in anything just by exposure. Uh, I have achieved confidence in things by gaining skill. 
And so I don't know, maybe that's just me, but I think there's some, some value in that for new people is like work and develop your skill rather than just trying to like mentally trick yourself into to being okay with something that might not actually be okay. Concealing a firearm is actually a social skill as well as a physical combination of gear, posture, clothing. Like the same way that a person who is very comfortable initiating a conversation with a stranger in a cheerful, friendly, open, engaged way, that person gives off an entire range of completely different social cues from a person who is nervous, standoffish, fidgeting, visibly uncomfortable. Like it, it, it fits into a whole range of things which are all themselves generally net positives. Being able to initiate a productive, friendly conversation with a stranger is a real skill that has actual value. Being able to carry a firearm in a variety of contexts with a high level of skill and confidence that's not nervous, that's not um, self-obsessed is a real skill and it can be built over time. Yeah, that's the challenge, I guess, is getting to that point, especially when you're when you're taking those first steps on that path. It's like kind of terrifying. I remember what that felt like, and it's not really fun. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish there were the resources then that there are now. Uh, now I feel like there's a lot more information out there about how to actually achieve good concealment. Because uh, I know when I first started carrying, it was like, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, I sucked at it. And I felt really self-conscious and I was actually printing all the time. So it was like, it was a, a fairly rational amount of, <laughs> you know, fear. Right. So, um, so, sometimes your gut is telling you something. If you're, if you're yeah. feeling really insecure about something, if it's not pathological, um, <laughs> you know, I'm pretty insecure about how well I ice skate because I don't. <laughs> right there, there's a hundred percent rational connection between my confidence in that and 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 and, and my insecurity about it. Right, uh, I'm insecure about my grappling skill because I don't have any. Sometimes, sometimes your insecurities are telling you the truth. We write off insecurity or 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 that kind of um, self doubt as like, oh, well, you shouldn't be so insecure. insecure. You just need some positive self-talk, John. Right, you just need positive self-talk. Get over your insecurities. In insecurities are things that you should ignore and overcome. Uh, sometimes that is your subconscious telling you the truth about what's happening. The first time I had a 240-pound brown belt kneel on my sternum on the jiu-jitsu mats, I realized, I realized that insecurity was not my problem. 240 pounds kneeling on my sternum was my problem. <laughs> Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. All right. So we're going to take a quick break again. When we come back, we're going, we're going to very lightly skim on some of the practical aspects of how to get good concealment. Now, we're not going to get super deep into this stuff because we've already done an episode on this. Uh, if you go back in the archives for the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, Caucus Live, uh, there's an episode on holster safety and selection that gets into the rights of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and shooting sports. Please consider becoming a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month. You can learn more at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to John Heltman of Filster Holsters and Andrew Henry of Henry Holsters. Our topic this week is concealment. So we've kind of gone, uh, we've, we've covered the controversy and we've covered some of the decisions that people need to make when they start carrying. Um, what I want to get into and, and just, you know, lightly touch on is uh, how, the how of concealment. Um, so if after listening to all of this, you think concealing a gun might be a good idea for you and you want to achieve good concealment, uh, how do you conceal? Where do you start? It's easy. You just get a fishing vest. <laughs> yeah, you just <laughs> get a you know, and shoulder see. holster and a suit jacket, right? All right. Well, I guess we'll leave. Perfect. Done. Yeah. Loafers, no socks, and you're done. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so the objective is to cause the entirety of the gun to carry in the space between your body and your clothing. That means that you're going to have to cause the gun to uh, conform to your body. We're going to have to apply some amount of mechanical force to the gun to keep it stuck to your body. If there's a gap between your gun and your body, typically that's where it's going to protrude or print through your clothing, right? If there's a gap between the grip of your gun and your body, it's probably not falling completely within the envelope of space between your clothing and your torso, right? Uh, so generally speaking, we're going to use belt pressure to apply force to the holster to bring it closer to the body. Now, sometimes it needs a little extra help. Sometimes you might need more grip rotation and sometimes you might need more grip tuck. Andrew, if you would bring us our uh, uh, props. I'll put you guys full screen, screen for this part. Okay, so with an inside the waistband holster, often on a lot of contemporary holsters, you'll see this piece here. This is referred to as a wing. And when the holster is being worn inside the waistband, the pressure from the uh, belt line, the, the belt applies pressure through your pants to the wing. Here's the wing by itself, right? And so that applies extra leverage to this part of the holster causing the grip of the gun to rotate into the body and conform to your body and fall within the envelope of space between your clothing and your body. Now, what happens for a lot of people is that also, you know, depending on how they're shaped, the gun will tip out away from them and the muzzle will dip in. So you get the whole top half of the gun printing through your shirt. Now, if you were to, uh, you know, stand there with your gun on and push on your gun, such that it, the printing part was within the envelope between your clothing and your body, you start to see a gap between the muzzle and the part of your body that's below the belt line. To cause the gun to stay in place, you know, at vertical or past vertical, such that it's actually kind of pushing into you, uh, you would want to fill in the gap between the muzzle and your body. And you can do that with a uh, wedge. A wedge is a very popular holster accessory. You can buy them, you can make them, you can get holsters that have wedges molded into them uh, from the factory. You can get them in different sizes and different angles, and those angles are going to do things like instigate more grip rotation, uh, fill in certain shaped gaps between the holster and your body, and you can even get foam. your own foam and sculpt a wedge specifically to fit you. Uh, Andrew previously said uh, you know, the, the only thing that we really carry around with us as much as a gun is a phone. Now, once we start talking about these issues, the next analogy comes in. I think carrying a gun is actually more like wearing a prosthetic than it is carrying something around. You're taking a mechanical object and interfacing it to your body for six, eight, 12 hours a day. You need to start thinking about it like it's a prosthetic and tuning it to fit you. If someone is missing a limb, they don't just throw this machine on their arm and say, you're good to go. They spend a lot of time using specific materials and techniques in order to cause the part of the mechanical device, which fits onto your organic form to fit it in a way that is tolerable, safe for your skin, not damaging to your body and <coughs> actually ergonomic. Uh, and when you strap a gun to your body, you should be thinking about it in terms of tuning a prosthetic. You're going to need to adjust your holster in a variety of ways in order to fit your body. And the better that it fits your body, the more tolerable it's going to be, right? I don't, I don't like talking about holsters in terms of them being comfortable. I like talking about them in terms of them being, being ergonomic. Uh, not only will it be more ergonomic, but the chances of it being more concealed as well 
uh, increase with your fine tuning. It's kind of like a, you get a new pair of boots and if you have had enough experience wearing and buying boots for work, for example, you'll know exactly what kind of insoles you're going to want to buy to go with your boots that fit your feet the best. Be prepared to do a little fine tuning to your holster. Even if it's like I bought a premium holster, it's a hundred bucks. It still isn't made to fit the contour of your body at the location where you're attaching the gun. You need to do that final 10, 15% of adjustment in order for it to fit you and conceal perfectly for you. And that's where we go from like the off the shelf suit to one that has been tailored for you, the custom fit prosthetic, not just the Dr. Scholl's insole, but one actually sculpted to match your foot profile that makes such a huge difference in the effect you see when you use it. Sorry, puppy's howling still. So I'm, I'm trying to remember to unmute myself before I start talking. <laughs> um, okay, so that is really good. Um, when, when we come back from break, I always ask people, where do we find you and what are you up to? Where can we find you online? Let's, get, let's do that real quick before we get to our last couple of questions. You can find me at filsterholsters.com and the Filster Concealment Workshop group on Facebook, where we go over a lot of this, this information, help people with uh, personalized concealment advice and uh, peer support for their concealment journey. You can find me at henryholsters.com. I'm also fairly active on Instagram at Henry Holsters. I'm also a member of the Filster Workshop for Concealment. And you'll see me in there helping customers adjust their rigs, making suggestions about gear replacement, hardware, different tools they can use to achieve the results that they want. Yeah, that's a great group. It's really become a, a great resource for people. That's the Filster Concealment Workshop on Facebook. So that's an open group anyone can join uh, as long as you answer the membership questions. <laughs> There's always a catch, right? Uh, so is there a certain carry position that gives you the best concealment? So there is a fact, there's an anatomical fact that we need to consider. Now, there are a lot of people who don't tolerate appendix carry well. There are a lot of people who have a body shape that competes with appendix carry uh, and causes uh, comfort and ergonomic issues. It's not for everyone. However, when you think about how your body bends at the waist, when you sit, squat, reach, lean, do any of these things. If the gun is concealed when it inhabits the envelope of space between your clothing and your body, and you do a normal motion which eliminates the envelope of space between your clothing and your body, like when you sit down or lean or bend, your garment will always tension across your back. You will always uh, cause your shirt to get tighter around the back of your body and your waist when you do any number of these things. So if your gun is located there, you will always stretch your shirt around your gun and cause printing when you wear it on or behind the hip. That's just a fact of how bodies work and is unavoidable. Uh, and we say that as people who have recently developed some really advanced strong side outside the waistband holsters that take all of these mechanical uh, uh, mechanics and principles into consideration. And we still cannot overcome just the natural effect of how your body moves and what your garments do when your body moves in them. When you lean forward, you'll always increase the drape of clothing over the front of your body. So, your normal range of motion is more likely across most people to cause an appendix carried gun to be the least visible under the most circumstances. The and only way to real... effectively, yeah. Oh no, I was gonna say real quick, just define where is appendix carry? Where is that on the body? We're talking forward of the hips, anywhere between, you know, uh, 930 and 230 between the, the front points of your, your pelvis. To John's comment about the way clothing moves around your body when you bend forward, we generally bend one direction. From the hips, we hinge forward. Right. 
And that means that the majority of the movements you make deliberately or even sort of unconsciously throughout your day are going to slack the fabric at the front of your body and tension the fabric behind your body. And really the only way to effectively conceal things that are carried behind the point of your hips is to add enough layers of clothing that the printing is lost in the noise of the contour of the layers. So I can put on a big puffy down jacket in the winter and I can conceal almost any firearm I own behind my hip because when I bend forward, there's enough dead space in that depth of fabric that it goes away. But depending on where you live and the season you're in and the environment, like I don't wear a down coat to the jiu-jitsu gym. I don't wear a down coat onto the beach. There are a lot of places where that depth of fabric isn't plausibly available to me. And uh, do you guys have any suggestions for people who are just learning this? We're, we're, we've got like four minutes left. <laughs> so what I'd like to know is if you're starting out, where do you go to learn some of these mechanics and concealment principles and how do you get better at this? Well, it just so happens that we have a wealth of resources. If you go to filsterholsters.com and click on, uh, what is the link? Uh, the principles of uh, uh, concealment mechanics or concealment basics. It's on our website. Let me pull that up real quick because I'm blanking on the link. It's under edu this, educational we're resources. In, <laughs> yes. We're living in a golden age of freely available, high quality information about concealment. And that's largely come about because the internet does enable best practices to be shared widely and freely and also allows people to share real world results. Like 10 years ago on a gun forum, someone would say, my holster conceals great. And they're writing that in plain text and you either believe that put that out in front of other people who have time to like, they can watch that little 30 second clip three or four times and play spot the gun. Um, and that's meant that the pace at which we learn things, has greatly accelerated. Yes, and then on top of it, people are sharing their tips for how to accomplish this. And the interesting thing is that a lot of these people's tips wind up being fairly similar. Yeah. Right? It's not as though uh, <clears throat> there are wildly divergent arguments in how to accomplish concealment. There's a lot of consensus in how to accomplish concealment which is a pretty good clue that either we're all oblivious in exactly the same way or we're all, we're all on track of something that works. So you can go to the uh, filsterholsters.com and look up the basics of concealment mechanics. I also have a YouTube channel uh, under the name Philly EDC, and we have uh, recorded a number of lectures uh, that we've done on this topic, like, for example, the Active Self-Protection National Conference. You yourself, have, Sarah, have a video. Uh, Carry and scrub. A, a, a video series on that channel called How to Carry and Scrubs, which goes over a lot of this stuff and a lot of uh, self-diagnosis tips and tricks for evaluating your concealment, how to pick up a concealment position, and then how to apply these concealment mechanics within that context. Yeah, and I'm going to go ahead and plug another channel here that I think people should know about. It's Armed and Styled. So that's Armed and Styled on YouTube, and I think it's like Armed underscore and underscore styled on Instagram. Uh, that is a great channel for, for breaking down those concealment mechanics. Uh, and it's also a, kind of a style blog. So there's like style inspiration for women, uh, tips and tricks for concealing on, on a you know petite frame. So if that's something that concerns you, that is a really good resource for that. Okay. Well, the howling is reaching a crescendo over here and, uh, <laughs> just in time for us to be done. <laughs> Uh, so this is just uh, the overture. Yeah, this is right. Well, Prayer. thank you very much for joining us, guys. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, good knowledge, thank you guys you, are Sarah. awesome. So that's really Thanks good. For us. Yeah, happy to. And thank you for watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Uh, next week Minnesota. we're going to be. <laughs> Yeah. Next week, we're going to be talking about uh, how to save money in the gun world. So save money on shooting, save money on guns. What should you uh, what should you look for bargains on? What should you never skimp on? Uh, we're going to have a really good panel discussion on that. So that's coming up next week, which I believe is the 21st at 7 p.m. Central. Thanks for watching and good night.